All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in. As you can see, we have a special little something here and we got together in the town that I'm staying in, beautiful Skopje. It's a special occasion that we get to do this Q&A together in this live setting. And um, we are going to answer some of your questions in this pre-recorded format. And just want to let you know that the training program that we've been threaten threatening you about for a while, and we are going to actually include the nutritional package in that as well. Uh, the pre-sale for that is going to open up soon. And uh, we are actually planning to release that program on the 27th of August. Uh, originally, we were aiming for August 15. But as you know, you, there are always things that crop up that you wouldn't expect. So there's a little bit of a delay. And also that most people really wanted to start the program with uh, a diet to follow. So, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, there's a little bit of a delay. But uh, what is delayed is uh, not postponed till infinity. I was trying to translate a Hungarian saying, but didn't really succeed. So we are going to get into the Q&A now. And we have a couple of good questions that we selected. Some of some of them have been answered previously, but uh, we, I think we can always shed some new light on some questions. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. So the first question is with regards to weak point training, basically, is the short gist, is gist of the question. So let's say you have an actual weak point or some body part that seems to be lagging behind, and it's not just solely a body image issue. Um, how do you go about uh, addressing that? Hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I might have mentioned that before. Um, when it comes to some muscle groups, like arms and shoulders in particular, they tend to get a lot of indirect training from pressing and pulling movements. So for those muscle groups, um, if, if, you, if you're actually, if, if they are lagging behind and that's a real thing, it could actually be that you're working them too much, like directly. Um, that because you're already doing maybe 10 to 15 sets of pushing and pulling, and then adding like 10 to 15 sets of biceps and, and triceps on top of that and lateral races or whatever, you're, you're way up in, in a range where it might be too much, it might be excessive. Um, and, and, you know, consider that a lagging muscle group would by definition be less advanced and less advanced, uh, a less advanced muscle will usually respond better to a lower volume than uh, a more advanced muscle group. Uh, and so lowering volume on some muscle groups might be just the ticket that you need. I have, for instance, seen like individual muscle groups, um, like for myself, um, I always noticed that my work capacity was really shitty on pressing exercises. Like my chest, for instance, if I, a regular progression for me would be that I put a load on the bar, I managed, say for instance, eight reps on the first set, then the second set, even after four to five minutes of rest, I would maybe get five or six reps. So like doing three sets would be eight, five, three reps. And other muscle groups, I could do probably eight, seven, seven. And so that tells you that that muscle group probably has a lower work and volume capacity. Uh, I would all also notice that my, my chest and my pressing just, uh, you know, if I repeated the same workout two to three days later, I would usually be at the same level of uh, strength, whereas on the other muscle groups with a higher work capacity, I would be recovered and actually gain. So um, looking at your performance in the gym, um, if you tend to have a major drop off in, in performance from one set to the next, that could be an indicator that you should do lower volume for that muscle group. Uh, it could also be that it's more like uh, fast twitch and more explosive and perhaps you would um, get better results with lower rep training. So lower reps and lower volume could be the answer for that. Um, other than that, specialization would, um, would be a matter of training that muscle group first. So if your calves are a weak point, then doing them first in every workout could be the answer. Uh, sometimes just playing with the frequency, so adding frequency. So instead of adding volume, uh, you could, um, if, if that, my, you know, if you're already doing a low volume and, and you think that adding some volume would be the answer, and it could very well be, then uh, try adding frequency. So increasing the weekly volume through added frequency. So if you're training that muscle group twice a week, try increasing that to three times per week and, and maybe adding some isolation stuff to that. So priority, like training it first when you have the most energy, increase the frequency, increase the volume in that order, I, I would try. Uh, I also think that load progression 
is you know the primary driver of muscle growth, as I have stated in the in the group. So sometimes even if you're stuck at a certain load and, and rep count, I would try to just overload that, like intentionally add load to the bar and accept that the reps drop, and see what happens. Sometimes that can be the the key to get muscle growth to restart. Um. Would you say that sometimes you just need to get bigger overall? Like when someone something is really stagnating, like uh, for example, um, I noticed that my arms were just like really lagging behind, and they are well, they will never become like a strong body part for me. They're all, always going to be like a relative weak point. But I noticed that as I gotten bigger overall, then I, also my arm size increased. So would you say that's also sometimes a consideration? Yeah, for sure, and especially when it comes to arms that. Sometimes people just drop direct arm work and just focus on getting bigger and stronger overall, and those lagging muscle groups don't really lag all that much anymore. Right. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, let's get into the next question, which is uh, about bulking and cutting cycles. So if someone's goal is to just look pretty good, like they're, they don't have necessarily, necessarily the aim to get on a bodybuilding stage, or but I guess this question could also apply to bodybuilders to some extent. like. What is your thought on the necessity to go through these overeating periods, like smart overeating periods, like being an intentional caloric surplus for a, a prolonged period and that followed by a, a fat reduction phase? Like, can you just accomplish the same thing by just kind of always eating enough and keeping your body fat and body weight sort of at the same range? Well, I guess your body weight will increase over time if, as you add muscle, but to not intentionally go through these deliberate bulking periods. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, <clears throat> I, th I think it depends on, on the person in this case. Um, if you have a lot of fat, like a lot of body fat, and that's leading to like a range of issues like insulin resistance and, and you know, it will ruin your nutrient partitioning, your ability to actually build muscle from the calories you're eating, uh, getting down into a healthy body fat range as quickly as possible is going to be the first order of business. So... Uh, I would probably, if I was working with someone and, and uh, we were kind of in a hurry or had a deadline, I would do an actual cut. So just basically cut calories and, and get down into that healthy body fat range. And at the same time, entrain some better eating habits because that tends to be the, the cause of the elevated body fat percentage. Now, if, if someone is like skinny fat because they're, you know, sort of eternally dieting, then I would maybe have them intentionally bulk simply because they might have uh, uh, reduced metabolism and, and suboptimal hormone levels, testosterone levels or estradiol levels if you're a woman. So I've had great success with just intentionally having someone eat in a calorie surplus for a sufficiently amount of time. And that tends to, even if the body fat increases initially, they also start building muscle And they start to sort of get into a healthier body composition range where nutrient partitioning improves and ho hormones and thyroid health just improves. And even at the same calorie surplus, it's like they, they, they start to lean out while they're adding body weight. So again, the calories in, calories out model can be a little, um, um, you know, it, 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 it can be a, a little... Um, Not, not true to what actually happens in the real world as what the body is actually doing with those calories might, you know, change according to your internal health, internal uh, environment. Uh, having said that, if, you, if you've already been doing the cutting and bulking stuff, I mean, I, I see people that just cut for half of the year and bulk for half, to the, half of the year. And, and, you know, through a combination of, of uh, lifestyle variables or whatever, you know, you tend to maybe cut for too long or excessively hard and bulk, you know, the same way and maybe not have the healthiest relationship with food where, you know, you try to bulk, but you just bulk for two weeks and you feel fat and you start cutting again and vice versa. Um, I, I think at some point you're going to have to work on, on both your mindset to the whole process and, and, and just adopt a more sustainable approach again, which is the point of this uh, Facebook group. <clears throat> and um, also fix things at the brain level where, where you know, you have a, a range of signals like leptin and ghrelin and adiponectin and all of the signals that the body is uh, sending the brain to tell the brain whether everything is, is at where it should be. So at a certain level of leanness, you know, uh, and a certain level of muscularity, uh, body will tend to try to protect itself from further change. Uh, and the brain will interpret those signals 
to make you either eat more or eat less. And so sometimes at the brain level, when you start incorporating better eating habits and, and like the concept that we're going to introduce in, in the sustainable self-development uh, system, um, the body will naturally gravitate towards a leaner state, like a lower body fat state, and naturally um, direct incoming nutrients to muscle growth as long as those workouts are productive. So, so at this point, when, when you've sort of, I, I know it doesn't make sense at this point, but, but you know, eventually you will see. I, I'm, a, I'm sort of a bigger fan of, of trying to make the brain um, understand that the body fat should be low and the muscle mass should be high, you know, uh, within reason, of course. Um, and then, uh, because that will allow you to trust the signals of the body and just eat to comfortable fullness um, and uh, if you overeat, then you simply won't be that hungry the next day or for the next meal. And if you have a productive workout, you will be more hungry and the body will use those incoming nutrients for muscle growth. And, and sort of um, over time, I, I have even seen this in, in, in my own experiments where I went through like a strict uh, cutting phase and a bulking phase and the DEXA scans before and after. And I managed to to achieve some results. I can't recall the numbers off the top of my head right now. And then I just, you know, sort of got fed up with the whole thing, all the counting and measuring and, and always having to, um, to, to sort of fight against the signals that my brain was telling me. Like, okay, I'm hungry, but I can't eat because I need to cut fat. Or um, I don't want to eat. I feel full. I feel almost nauseous. But I have to force feed because I did legs, you know? And, and at a certain point, I just, you know, to hell with this and, and just eat according to my hunger and according to my food preferences that I knew I felt better on. And doing the same DEXA scan before and after, I had better results. I mean, I gained slight, uh, a slight amount of muscle mass, which at that point was impressive since, you know, I've been training for so many years. But I actually at concurrently lost a lot of, mus uh, a lot of fat mass. So, so that was just like a complete mindfuck for me because my uh, OCD cut and bulk approach produced uh, less optimal results or, or worse results than just sort of eating according to hunger and satiety. So, so yeah, I definitely think that's a possibility if you understand things from a top-down level instead of the starting from the calories in, calories out model and calculating calories and weighing and measuring and all that stuff. Because you can do that for a while, but... That's that's not going to be sustainable uh, for most people. Yeah, yeah. If I, I just want to add something to that. Yeah. Um, that like all of that aside, actually, like even if you're really bought into the whole bulking and cutting thing, like um, let's say there was some theoretical rationale for the need to go through these bulking and cutting periods. Like um, a lot of people, I think, who like like the question implies, are just in this to look decently and to look good on the beach and have have enjoyable workouts and enjoy life on the whole. Like, let's say you have a body fat percentage range of, I don't know, somewhere between 10% and, I don't know, 13%. You just feel pretty good. You Your libido is good. Energy levels are good. You can have good workouts. Like, even if there was some theoretical rationale to, like, get down to 7% body fat and bulk slowly all the way up to 16%. Like, if at 7% you have, like, libido issues and your body fat or your energy levels suck and your wor workouts are not productive, and at 15 16% body fat, you're, like, you, you lose your hunger signals and you're like not really happy with what you're seeing in the mirror and you know your clothes are not fitting well anymore like what's the point of going through all of that like just to gain an, an additional whatever one or two percent efficiency with your muscle building process like if you're like a prof professional bodybuilder and you want to take all of the boxes that theoretically could provide some benefit then sure but you know if you're just in it for the long haul to you know as a part of just enhancing your overall life quality then i just don't see the point of just going through long periods of under eating and then, you know, long periods of intentional overeating. Um, so, yeah. And that's sort of the same. That's, that's the same answer. We, you know, looking at the current volume discussion, that's never ending in the group. That's yeah. basically the same, the same thing. Yeah, for sure. You, you can, but, but should you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, we will have some questions about volume, I think, of course, as always. Okay. Um, so we have a good question about, if you can basically make it work when you're both working for muscle building and to some extent 
participating in some other activities that include some conditioning elements. So if you want to build muscle, but you also, I don't know, just like to participate in some sports which have like a strong cardio vascular kind of components. I don't know, maybe you like to play soccer or football with your friends or whatever. Like, to what extent do you think that's okay? Uh, I think that's completely fine. I mean, you will quickly notice if one affects the other um, and, and, you know, judge and monitor or monitor and judge according to your performance levels. And, um, but, but just keep in mind that, that the specialists are always better than the generalists. So, it's, it's for sure possible, and I have coached uh, a number of elite athletes and gotten some pretty good gains. I mean, they, they look like some of the, um, well, some of, some of the fitness guys, actually, since they're, it's so easy for them to get lean simply because they're doing so much uh, activity and training. And um, it doesn't take a lot of muscle mass to actually look good. So, so I definitely think it's possible, but, but to sort of... Um, ameliorate which means reduce the interference effect uh, where like power and strength and hypertrophy is at one end of the spectrum and endurance adaptations are at the other end of the spectrum uh, the more you separate those types of workouts um, the less interference those signaling events will have so doing like a muscle building workout on monday and doing some intervals or, or endurance uh, workout on tuesday that's you know completely fine and i mean you can look at i think a good example would would be alex viada is not his name mm -hmm. he's like he's won both uh, ultra endurance events and powerlifting events so it's it's definitely possible i mean he's probably a, a freak in many uh, in many ways but um it, it it's not impossible it's definitely possible and but but you can't expect to be you know most of us can't expect to be great at a marathon and be a great weightlifter or powerlifter at the same time. But you can look good and, and be an athlete at the same time, definitely. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good to me. I always like playing soccer. I'm just kind of scared of taking it up again because I think I'm just too old and I'm just going to injure myself. You're too old? <laughs> yeah, like uh, I already feel it. Like I can't just go out and start sprinting like a madman. Like when I was, but seriously, like when I was 15 years old, I could do it without a problem. Yeah. I honestly don't know how those kids do it. I don't know how I used to do it. But... Well, you probably worked up to it. Yeah. If you work slowly up to it, then you can do most stuff. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the next question is, it's kind of, um, I think the main gist of this question is, uh, to some extent we hammered this home before, but um, how should we think about uh, when you do a certain amount of volume, uh, is it possible, and let's say you're doing like 15 sets, is it possible that by doing less in the upcoming weeks, um, you're still going to get better gains? Or is it the case that once you adapt it to doing a certain amount of volume, then sort of like your body is resistant to volume and then you need to do even more to keep adapting. Like, sh does it violate the principle of overload if you do less volume on one week than what you did the previous week? Uh, no, not if you increase intensity and if you increase load on bar. Uh, that's, that's like a regular power, power lifting peaking cycle or the power building cycle even, that, that you can go from like higher volumes, like high number of sets, and you can reduce the number of sets as long as you increment the loads. So if you're currently doing, so let's say, eight sets of 10 reps twice a week, and you start doing sets of three to five reps, then you probably can't keep doing eight sets of that anyway. And um, even, even looking at, and, and this is a model presented on Greg Knuckles' site, Stronger by Science, where they looked at, well, if you keep the number of hard sets the same, then you, know, you, you will eventually or essentially get the same effect. But I think if you are increasing the loads, then you can also drop the volume and, and still you know, keep the growth signaling going. And, and there's plenty of evidence that increasing the loads actually allows you to drop the volume and still get better gains. And also there's the factor that if you're doing 15 sets and that's sort of leaving you in a chronically under-recovered state, then dropping the volume will most likely provide better gains for you, even if you don't change the loads. I have seen this over and over again, and it relates back to the first question that sometimes dropping direct arm work uh, drops the total weekly volume from 30 sets to 15 sets and the arms start growing again. So there's, there's multiple answers to this question, but I think in general you can definitely reduce the volume. I would say the most effective way to get gains at lower volumes is simply to take one or two weeks of rest and then get back to uh, training with a lower volume since the tissue sensitivity will be enhanced and uh, you can 
play around with lower volumes at that point instead of just constantly again if, if uh, while you can add volume should you it, at, at some point you're going to have to sort of consider the return of investment of, of adding that volume so but but the answer to the question is yes cool uh, then um, let me ask you something that uh, we talked about earlier today um, and it's handy because like you will do a Conversation. You will have a conversation with Mike Israel soon um, so on, on a podcast. It's just a surprise, not on my podcast, unfortunately. Um, but so basically a, a question that many people are probably asking now is, um, you know, we progress a lot of things and we, we vary a lot of things in our programs. So we increase load over time. We, maybe we change rep ranges. Like we know that increasing the stress is, is um, an important uh, factor in our training in many regards. Why make volume an exception to that? Like, why not scale from lower volume to higher volume over the course of a training cycle uh, to achieve uh, optimal hypertrophy, especially if or given, quote unquote, that volume is the primary driver of hypertrophy? Part of that question was addressed already. but Yeah, well, I, I just simply don't think it is the primary driver. I think uh, if you think that volume is the primary driver, you're sort of ignoring the, the function of, of frequency and, and uh, load. Um, <clears throat> but um, I, I think since within the context of increasing the load, which is going to add uh, stress to the tissue, and we have a lot of evidence showing that incrementing the load is one of the primary drivers for hypertrophy. So that's volume. Mm -hmm. It also adds volume. It, yes, it does add volume or it does add work more specifically because if you allow reps to drop while increasing the load, then you, it sort of balances out. So it might maintain the volume. Um, but um, I mean, even going back to the avian stretch models where they hanged uh, weights to the, to the wings of birds back way back in the day when they were looking at like the time under tension concept. And, and they, they noticed that like the muscles of these birds grew tremendously well, just hanging weights on them. Of course, the animal would move around and so they would contract against the load and it was, you know, it would be a pretty high volume uh, for sure. Just, you know, walking around all day with that. Uh, I've even heard of bodybuilders doing the same thing for the delts. So um, it, it, it tends to hurt a lot, but you know, that's, that's low load and incredibly high volume and, and we have some occlusion studies using 20% of one rep max uh, using just crazy volumes doing three sets three times a day six days a week and uh, so that's like 35 36 sets per week uh, no that's e even more uh, that's like 40 50 sets per week and they've seen some pretty impressive growth but that tends to stagnate after two to three weeks and so the other avian model they looked at back in the day um, was hanging weights on the bird's wings, but incrementing the load. And that just blew past any hypertrophy uh, or hypertrophy gains that, that was ever seen in any model. Um, and also the synergistic ablation studies where um, they, you know, these are done on animals, so don't do this at home, people. Uh, where they cut the tendon for the gastrocnemius muscle, so the soleus muscle needs to or has to bear the load of the animal, and so there's not that you know is, is, there's no recovery, there's no set reps, rest periods, whatever. It's just constant tension, and yeah, super high volume for sure. But the main driver there is that the soleus needs to essentially take over the work of a missing muscle group, and and uh, it only takes a few days for that muscle to grow as large and strong, and, and basically replacing the function of the missing muscle. Um, so, so we have for sure an amazing growth capacity and, and again, to repeat myself for probably the hundred, hundreds, hundreds of time that increasing volume is for sure tied to increased hypertrophy in the short term, as long as you can recover from it. But our approach, which is called the sustainable self-development for a reason is that unless you plan to compete the next year or two, what's the hurry? So increasing volume means that you need to increase the time in the gym and you also increase your recovery needs. Of course, adding load will also increase recovery needs, but not to the same ex extent as adding volume. At the other end of the spectrum, super high volume, we're looking at endurance training and strength endurance adaptations. And we know that just doing you know, a lot of volume tends to require more recovery than just within a certain volume range, adding some load. That tends to initiate the exact signal in cascades that we're after 
without adding a lot of recovery needs on top on top on top of that so for sure if you want to do like a cycle where you gradually increase the volume and while increasing the load and you're actually able to recover from that i would say that many people would probably notice that this becomes harder and harder to recover from so you would probably have to add in more rest days and more recovery days to even be able to do that then feel free to do that you know i'm not going to say that that's not going to work at all but you're going to have to spend more time in the gym and if that's an investment you're willing to make go ahead i think that's that's perfectly fine but but again looking at volume in isolation from load frequency and all the other variables you you can manipulate and over a, a whole training cycle i i think you can operate within a more narrow range instead of playing all the way up into the 15 to 20 set range and, and still get, get great gains and and we're just going to present a completely new model to this that uh has a few techniques and and and, um, and stuff that really maximizes the pathways and adaptations that that we're after and and so a good analogy I like to use is, is like the investment strategy. So if you have um, you have $1,000 in your savings account and you would like to invest, invest $200 of those. Now, you can ask uh, uh, an analyst, like an expert in this, and he will, he will like diversify your portfolio. He will find the best stocks for you. He will perhaps find a cryptocurrency and, uh, you know, whatever. He's going to make the best use of that money and... and and potentially over time, over the next few years, he's going to be able to, you know, make you a lot of money. Now, that's a safe and sound strategy, but it's a smart strategy. It's an intelligent strategy. And there's constantly watching, you know, putting stop losses on the, on the, on the stock so that when it falls below a certain point, then, you, re, you know, you sell it and you invest in something else. And just having knowledge of the market and mon monitoring and adjusting and, and putting your money to work where they will uh, provide the best return of investment. That's the sustainable self-development thing. But what you could do is just take all of your savings and put it into like a volatile stock or a cryptocurrency because you might earn a lot of money from it. And yeah, some people have gotten really rich doing that, but others have lost all their money. And I think judging from the, the um, questionnaires and the surveys we have done, that a lot of people have done the high volume stuff already. And it's been messing them up completely. Or they have done it, but just not seen the results uh, to go with all the time and effort they put into that. So, so that's our perspective on it. So I don't disagree with Mike. I don't disagree with, with Brad Schoenfeld that adding volume and volume is a good driver of muscle hypertrophy. But when you introduce the other variables and absolutely, or know how to intelligently um, optimize those variables so that you get a better return of investment, then we're going to make those $200 work for you. So you don't have to put all your money into whatever you think is going to, um, you know, make you rich. Bam. My microphone dropped. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, I was going to have a follow-up, but uh, that was a perfect yeah, way to end. Not. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so nutrition-related questions. Um, auto regulation of caloric intake of the current day based on how we see ourselves in the mirror in the morning. Well, it's kind of probably it's um, the the answer is sort of in the in the question as well, like how you see yourself in the morning. <laughs> but probably like a better question to ask is like, can the way you like hold water and like body weight and those sorts of things be an indication to decide how much food you need? And uh, with that, like, what other factors determine? Uh, when you decide, you know, how much to eat in a meal, I guess, but also throughout the day, you know, when you wake up in the morning? You know, I think the short and sweet answer to that is you can never trust what you see in the mirror because <laughs> that's going to be affected by so many variables and, and you, you basically can't trust yourself. If you have someone that can be objective with you, like if you have a coach that can tell you what to do, then for sure I've seen people just manipulate like the carbs up and down depending on how they look at the very end of a competition prep and have that work. Um, but due to the water fluctuation, and it could be sodium, it could be heat, it could be, there's so many variables looking visual appearance that manipulating your calories or macros on a day-to-day -day basis uh, uh, based on visual feedback alone. Uh, no, sorry, I'm not a big fan. I, I think you should more trust, you know, what's going on in the body and the signaling in the brain and inside the body. It's going to be a more reliable indicator. And even then, 
we're we're on the micro managing uh, scale here. That's that's probably just going to mess with your head if you do that on a day to day basis based on on you know looks. Would you say that if you were like more watery or maybe for a couple of days in a row, you just uh, seem to be like just kind of squishy, just, uh, you know, maybe that would be an indication that it could also be that you're just your food choice is already weird. Like you're just eating way too much sodium or something like that, but maybe also that you're just overdoing food and maybe just an alarm sign that maybe you're just not as in tune with your satiety signals as you should be. You can't make that conclusion at all because I've seen people in extreme fat loss phases look really watery mm. and then suddenly they have one day of eating more and they look better in the mirror simply because they drop a ton of water. So stress can, can increase your, your uh, water retention levels. But yeah, so can food. Uh, certain foods can have that effect. Suddenly increasing sodium can have that effect. Suddenly decreasing sodium can also have that effect. Uh, th I mean, there's so many variables in play that... that Unless you're like really super lean at the very end of a contest prep where you can actually reliably see what's going on with your muscle size and, and um, like how flat you are. And, and it really takes a trained coach's eye to see that. But for most people, oh, sorry, you, you're going to have a more long term perspective on it. Like the, the, the most frequent weigh ins and measuring I do with my clients is, is weekly. But for some people, you should do like a bi weekly assessment where you measure your body fat levels. Uh, you need to train yourself actually or have someone qualified to measure your body fat levels with a body fat caliper. Uh, you use trends in body weight. You don't like go by a day's measurement. Um, strength and performance in the gym, energy levels, just a ton of variables that you take into account to make a decision of whether you should, you know, decrease or increase calories. But the answer to that question is no, that's just going to mess with your head even more. Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, um, if you just think about it, or at least speaking for myself, but I think I can also speak for you, like you could be overeating significantly, but if you're eating like mostly meat and fat and just kind of lower residue foods, like you could be just looking flatter or, you know, like uh, leaner, drier, and you could be under eating severely for multiple days or weeks. But if you're just eating like a, you know, a bag of broccoli with every meal, then you're just going to look bloated and watery as hell. So uh, that's just to show that uh, visual appear or assessment can be like kind of tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So uh, last couple of uh, questions. Um, there, there was like a second part of that question that I would kind of like to address. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where they said, because if I only follow my appetite and cravings, I'll end to eat only cheesecake and ribs. <laughs> And yeah, appetite and cravings, that's different from hunger, like real physical hunger. And that was like the major takeaway by following the all meat and fat diet was that I would actually physically feel that I needed uh, energy, like calories, but I wouldn't like automatically crave chocolate. So just um, the best way to get rid of cravings is to starve it, which is why all of these, um, you know, programs where you cut, cut sugar for a whole, full month or whatever, just stay away from junk food for a while. You know, you will, it's called starving the craving. So eventually the food memory of that food, you know, the memory of that food will sort of dissipate and you won't like crave and have appetite for the same types of foods anymore. Like you won't necessarily want junk food. Um, you will actually begin to be able to trust your um, hunger signals even more so than your appetite and cravings. So there's a big difference. Like a, a good saying is that if you're actually hungry, you can eat more of the same food. If you have cravings, you want chocolate or ice cream or, mm. or cheesecake. <laughs> yeah, that's the difference. Yeah, actually, at one point I wanted to record a video. Maybe I'll still do it like uh, three types of people or five types of people. I forgot how many it was that I would recommend a carnivore diet experiment for. Mm. And one of those was like I, I contact some guys here and there who just get like start climbing up on the hedonic staircase of eating as mike israel really um fittingly uh, called it mm -hmm. and like they're just so used to eating these super sweet super rewarding foods that going back to just eating like the same types of foods so maybe like fruits and veggies and those sorts of stuff like they just can't make that step back because like their state taste receptors are just so desensitized and i think in that context going on a, like a kind of an extreme approach like this yeah. can be like a really cool, like reset on the whole system. Yeah. Cause like you learn to, you basically, you lose the entertainment value of food basically. Cause like, what's your next meal? Well, it's like meat and fat and the next one, meat and fat. Like, yeah, it's tasty, it's enjoyable, but it's sort of a different type of food reward after some time. So something to consider. Sure. Uh, okay. So, um, 
there's like a question about um, deloads and kind of deconditioning. So for hypertrophy, should deloads be seen as a way to effectively cycle adaptation potential to stimulus versus washing out fatigue? Um, yeah, so let's yes. talk about this. That's yes? That's a yes. Okay. <laughs> That's basically what we have seen so far in research and, and uh, a lot of interesting unpublished data as well um, that, that you, you just see that. You know, I, I believe I posted a link in the in the group at one time uh, where they looked um, at an occlusion study. Or it was an occlusion study by Matthias Wernbaum and some Norwegian researchers, and th these were trained guys, and and they saw quite robust increases in muscle growth from occlusion training. But after you know um, entering the third week, uh, all the signaling just basically stopped. You know, they didn't see any response anymore. And at that point, obviously, you can start in incrementing the loads, but, but they tried something different. They had like, um, I think it was one or two, two weeks of rest. And when they restarted the program, um, they saw the same response. It was like a new response, like that person had never trained before. Um, and they saw the same growth processing, you know, going on. And, and at that point, they hadn't lost all the adaptations from the first training cycle, even if it was just a three week training cycle. So looking at it on a longer term perspective, of course, you can't resensitize the tissue all the way back to the untrained state, but you're, you're, you're um, definitely going to lower the stimulus threshold where even one set, like for instance, for our program, I'm just doing the first couple of workouts, I'm just doing like one set, a couple of reps from failure, 40% of one rep max, and I'm just getting crazy sore as hell. Like it was, you know, like I did a 10 set workout. So, so yeah, and that subsides within the next week or so. And then you keep adding load and, and basically increment the volume. So yeah, I guess, you know, at that point you also increment the volume, but we don't keep incrementing the volume. But, but for sure, that period of rest is, is the best way, I think, to sensitize the tissue to hypertrophy. Whereas having deloads where you just reduce um, the volume uh, and possibly even the load is a good tapering strategy if you want to display strength at a weightlifting or powerlifting competition. Yeah, I just did my first workout of like 20 reps, like just one set. I'm really curious how I will feel tomorrow. Mm. Um, yeah, because normally I would definitely not get sore from that, but now I expect some good, some good pain. Yeah. Um, okay, so maybe I can finish with a fun question. Uh, what are your favorite books, documentaries, blogs, and their movies outside of fitness? And what does fun look like for you, assuming you didn't have a son? <laughs> assuming I didn't have a son uh, well I guess uh, you know I'm into cars, engines uh, optimizing that, making uh, a small engine run faster which you know can be you know, there are many similarities to making no responders into high responders in the fitness world as well um, well one of my all time favorite movies is The Matrix but uh, you know the, I, I do tend to like superhero movies I always had that, you know, since I was a kid, since I was basically never good at anything. Uh, I was always the physically inferior to my buddies. Then, you know, that sort of uh, triggered my whole, well, one day, you, you, you know, you have this uh, talent or super power inside you that just is just waiting to come out, you know. So that's sort of um, just g gave me goosebumps to to look at those type of movies, and and that's the central theme of you know Neo in the Matrix, and he doesn't realize what the Matrix is, and that he can actually stop bullets by just raising his hand, and you know it's it's just it just kind of plays into my fantasy of someday being uh, a sort of superhuman. Um, I do like uh, documentaries. Uh, I do like sports documentaries. Even though I'm not a big fan of CrossFit documentaries, I have watched a lot of CrossFit documentaries just so I can sit there and, uh, you know, um, talk to my girlfriend about who's using drugs or not <laughs> and who's having obvious body dysmorphia issues and uh, whether this or that exercise or whatever is smart. And um, uh, I, I do like... Um, you know, uh, looking into the whole marketing and sales aspect, basically because I suck at it myself. Uh, and, and But just the human psychology and how you can convince people to do stuff that uh, they don't even know yet that they want to do. That's, you know, persuasion and all that stuff is, is uh, really interesting that we are so easy to man manipulate and that we are so good at manipulating ourselves uh, on what we see in the mirror, obviously. So psychology, I think Jordan Peterson has a lot of good stuff, um, you know, but, but I, I, I'm still, I still wasn't able to get through his book. Um, so, so I think it's just maybe some tedious uh, 
uh, reading. Um, Stephen King books. I like the whole, um, you know, dark type of supernatural approach and, and you know, obviously some of his movies, the Shawshank Redemption and the Green Mile, uh, those type of movies are really great. Shawshank Redemption is a Stephen King stuff? Yes, it's based on the Stephen oh. King book. It's, yeah, it's, shame. yeah, it's probably, I think it's the number one movie on IMDb. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Or after the, uh, the Earth documentary movies or whatever by David Attenborough. Um, blogs? No, I don't read blogs outside of, and, and even in the fitness realm, I, I, you know. You listen to my podcast, right? Yeah, once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I do listen to some podcasts, um, but everything ranging from keto to carnivore and, and all the way to the other side on the vegan, vegetarian and longevity projects and all that stuff. I just basically want to get as many sources as possible to, to see if I can fit it into a more um, uh, like holistic kind of perspective to explain why some people respond a certain way and, and or not. So, yeah, those are the ones uh, off the top of my head. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, what I will say, not that anybody cares, um, one of my favorite, all-time favorites is Dumb and Dumber. Like, it's just so <laughs> hilarious. But one of my all-time favorite movies is Limitless with uh, Bradley Cooper, I think yeah. that's his name. Yeah. Bradley Cooper. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's just a funny story that when I saw that movie was when about I was about to start college. And I was just super insecure because I didn't feel smart enough for college. And that sort of thing, like, then I started to look for the magic bullet. And that was sort of the thing that kind of just sent me down the rabbit hole of trying every single fad and every single bullshit thing. I drank bulletproof coffee. I did like alternate day fasting. I That propelled me to do, do the endless permacutting things that a lot of the stuff that I talk about on the podcast. And I think like that was the beginning of just doing a lot of things out of insecurity. And we see a lot of that same stuff coming from guys who comment in our Facebook group and just, just kind of so prevalent in the fitness industry on the whole. And sort of that's uh, the whole thing that our whole you know work is against or like sort of as, a, as an aim to get out of that state for a lot of people. So mm. it's kind of uh, funny that someone asked that question because it reminded me of that time period again. Yeah. Cool. We've so been, we've all been there, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. wanted to hack ourselves, biohacking and all that stuff. Although I'm not a big fan of that term. But just, I mean, improving ourselves and, and uh, eventually coming to the conclusion that, you know, stop majoring in the minors as the saying goes, you know, stop micromanaging. Because that's only going to make you unhappy eventually and, and lose out on what life actually has to offer you. And, and I don't think anyone will go out of this life saying that, oh my God, I regret my, my six pack wasn't more visible. Or that I didn't you know, spend my time doing 20 or 30 sets per week instead of <laughs> six to 10 sets. Uh, or you know that I, I think you're going to at that point just regret not spending more time with your family, having more fun, having more experiences. I think, you know, experiences makes us way more happy than, than money does. Money is just a facilitator of experiences, in my, in my opinion. So on that yeah. note, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. We got to the end of the questions and I think our camera is going to give out in any second. So just once again, to reiterate what we said in the beginning, uh, stay tuned for our upcoming training and nutritional template. We are going to receive uh, an announcement when the pre-sale is going to be out so you can pre-order for a discounted price. And also subscribers of our newsletter, which you can subscribe to or opt into if you go to sustainableselfdevelopment.com. Uh, you're going to give a pretty substantial discount on that. So I recommend that you check that one out. And as always, join the Sustainable Self-Development Facebook group. So I just spared myself an outro that I need to edit in. So thanks everyone for tuning in and see you next time.